Hello, Mike. Oh, yeah. I wanted to start this conversation um, by it, seeing if you remember a certain incident which made an impression on me at the time when I was at St. Martin's School of Art studying film and video. You came in uh, one afternoon to show a film. You were invited by uh, a tutor called Mary Pat Lease and showed one of your films, which I believe may have been Grown Ups. I think and it probably was. You might remember because the main feature of the screening was that they put the reels on in the wrong order. So we got, I think we got reel one, and then we got the ending, and then we got the middle bit, which I remember you not being that pleased about. No, I mean, I'm, I am incredibly conventional as a filmmaker <laughs> in that I, I've got this perverse preference for the reels of my films to be shown in the right order. You know? yeah. I wondered at the time how, I mean, obviously it's a long time ago, it's probably the late, late 80s, early 90s, uh, how that had come about, whether you'd been to college with Mary Pat Lee or No, like uh, Mary Pat Lee was a student of mine at the London Film School. Right. Um, but I seem to remember, I thought you were going to say this, about that screening, I've got a vague recollection that the outstanding characteristic, and I'd forgotten about the reels being shown in the wrong order because that's happened on various occasions to any number of filmmakers. Mm. But what I think I remember is that that was one of those screenings I went to where I was attacked by, in this case, and I say this with antique nostalgia, militant feminists yes. of the kind who brought a kind of black and white, humourless uh, principle of the philosophy of life to the whole proceeding. And I find it very difficult to deal with because they were confronting me with things that really, to which there was no answer given the nature of what we were dealing with. Does yeah. that ring bells with you? It does. I had three years of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, interestingly enough, um, with Meantime, um, a, a similar thing, not quite the same, happened twice. Once in the East End of London at the Rio Cinema, Dalston, and once in Sydney, Australia, at screenings of Meantime, uh, where guys from the hard left stood up and attacked me for wasting the opportunity of really make, coming out uh, 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 in the meantime and making a real socialist statement. Because what they wanted was a film where you saw the working class manning the barricades and burning the capitalists and all of that, assassinating people. Well, meantime, obviously, isn't such a film. The paradox is that actually, meantime, in its own subtler way, has got quite a lot to reflect on and say about related matters. But it was seen by these guys, people on the left, including some filmmakers, as being a waste of, an op a waste of resources, a waste of an opportunity to really make a statement. Yeah, and apart from th that aspect of it, I remember there being a kind of incredulity uh, of, of like, uh, that you were serious about making a film about these kinds of people, almost like as if these kinds of people didn't really exist. Which I, I guess is kind of what you're talking about here, that sometimes people want films, they want the characters in films to represent a type or to make a statement about the world. And it seems to me that you're more interested in actually presenting real human characters who are flawed and don't particularly stand for one thing or the other. Well, yes. We're not dealing in stereotypes. We're dealing with the idiosyncratic um, studies of people like you and me and everybody in this room and everybody. We are all uh, a bundle of contradictions and imperfections and heroics as well, you know. Um, but through that, we're actually making... One can make all kinds of statements of a quite fundamental nature, you know, but implicitly and not um, in a kind of uh, simplistic, crude, black and white way, obviously. So it was funded by Central TV, so it was, it was shown on, on British telly. So, so what was the genesis of Well, the, the important thing about it is actually um, it was the, the funding came from Central TV, but the most, the, what's important about it is that it was a Channel 4 film. Right. It was actually the third 
Channel 4 drama. Now, I mean, in, in a way, it's, to get its context, uh, it, it's worth a little bit of history, which was that for a long time it was impossible to make serious indigenous British films within the film industry. And all of us that made films, who were lucky enough to make films at all, did so for television for a long stretch of time from the um, really the late 60s through to the early 80s. I mean, everybody from Ken Loach downwards, uh, we, we all, the voice was television. Uh, and in fact, we used to sit around saying, you know, we don't, the world out there, the rest of the world, in world cinema, including in the States, think that there's no British filmmaking. And in fact, we, we'd say, you know, it, there's a really strong film culture here, alive and well, but hiding in television. And we used to say to the BBC, you know, why can't we make these films on 35mm and give them a theatrical release and then show them on television? And they said, no, oh, no, you can't do that because this, that, and the other reason, the unions and all sorts of uh, excuses. And then guys from the BBC, headed by Jeremy Isaacs, started Channel 4. And Channel 4's remit was let's make television films, but let's make them as theatrical films, put them out internationally and show them on television. And that's what happened. And with producer Graham Benson, he and I went along to Channel 4. We said, can we do it as a feature film? In other words, on 35mm, and not just as a telefilm. And he said, if this was next year, you'd be able to, but we're not quite there yet. So it was made, it was, I say, the third film that was made as a telefilm on 16mm. Had it been made as a feature film, meantime, I think history would have been quite different. It, it, it was shown on television, on, on uh, Channel 4, I think a couple of times. It was shown, and then it sank without trace. But there were lots of bootleg copies kicking around, recorded off air. There was no, uh, you couldn't buy it in the shops or anything. And I used to receive letters on a regular basis from people who would say, I'm unemployed, I've seen this film, I've got a copy of this film in the meantime, and it's a lifeline, it's great, and I thank you, and all that, you know. And it went on for years. And eventually, it started to, we started to find ways of um, getting it out there, uh, uh, and uh, but it really was. I, I, I never anticipated that it would reach the lofty heights it now is by being in the Criterion Collection. Mm. I suppose one of the first things people will latch onto is is the cast list, because it is quite an extraordinary cast, with with actors who have gone on to become well known, but probably in some of the very first roles. Yeah. So I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about how the cast came Well, the, you know, uh, actors from, from around, um, Gary Oldman, Tim Roth, Marion Bailey, Phil Daniels, Alfred Molina and the rest. I mean, they were all actors kicking around uh, and had done... Uh, I mean, Gary Oldman had done, I think, no film at all. Tim Roth had been in that film of Alan Clark's Made in Britain. In mm. fact, Alan Clark said to me, you should see this lad, he's really good. And uh, that's led to Tim Roth being in it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, who could have anticipated that they would <laughs> become the megastars they have? I think probably what, what it is important to talk about is what the film is about and where it came from. I and mean, this was the first of what I suppose loosely I've retrospectively come to regard as a kind of trilogy of... Um, political films, actually, in the sense that they were all Thatcher-era films. I was making a film a couple of years earlier than Meantime, and I was filming uh, in Bedfordshire, in the middle of nowhere, and I was, it was very early in the morning and I was having a quick bath. There was no shower from this particular flat I'd been put in. And um, the radio was on, and there was a thing about two lads in Warrington, in Lancashire, Merseyside it now is, who had committed suicide because they were unemployed. And I thought, 
that just sowed a seed. The film that if I, the next film I made was Meantime, it came out of that. Obviously, it's not about two lads that committed suicide, but the genesis of the, of the idea of the film, of the state that people get into because of this whole condition of, of just the endless black tunnel of unemployment, uh, it came out of that. Thatcher's government were inventing all these really sham, bogus schemes uh, to make it look as though they were solving the, in, the uh, unemployment problem uh, by giving paltry sums to, for people to, to, to do work and tra train and things, but they didn't go anywhere and didn't last any length of time or had no real meaning and, and no way could lead to anything real. And in a way, the... Uh, element in the meantime of Auntie Barbara's scheme for Colin to paint was kind of uh, a reference to that mm. uh, thing. Um, but really, the film, uh, it was about, uh, um, it came out of the whole uh, very much burgeoning disease of unemployment and was a reflection on all of that. Uh, the other two films in what, as I say, have retrospectively come to regard as a Thatcher political trilogy. Well, the second one was Four Days in July, which we made in Belfast, and then High Hopes, which is the only film that actually mentions Thatcher. Hmm. For me, personally, the timing of this film is interesting because it, it came out in 1983. That's the, time, that's the time that I left school. So watching the film, I, I felt it very much recreated the world that I kind of walked out into. Even down to a very strange coincidence with the the kind of council guy who comes round and he and he won't sit on a chair. He doesn't believe in chairs. <laughs> but when I when I'd left school I went and lived in this abandoned warehouse and the the guy who uh, I lived with he also had a ban on chairs. <laughs> so uh, I lived for about two years without chairs. Difficult meal times. <laughs> it brought back a lot of memories for me there, and it's a world that's disappeared. What a lot of people did when, uh, of, of my generation, you got to the end of school, and you just went straight onto the door. There wasn't even any real thought about getting a job. Yeah, it was, the door was what you did. Yeah, it was like, I, I guess I have a slightly ambivalent attitude to that now because in some ways. Especially now, people have a slightly rosy-coloured view of that. Of like, it was almost like a state-subsidised art scheme that creative people could go and sign on the dole mm -hmm. and they'd have a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. But also, it led to a lot of uh, people just drifting around, floating around without any sense of purpose whatsoever. Which is, in fact, what the film's about, really. Yeah, and that's, that's what I find interesting about the film, is that there's... Like you say, you got attacked by these people thinking that you should be giving more of a voice to the working class. But the, in a way, the working class, when work is taken away, find it very difficult to define themselves. It's like they've got Absolutely. nothing to really define themselves with. Absolutely. I mean, to, to be honest, uh, all that criticism was profoundly uh, not just annoying, but, you know, really rankled at the most, at the deepest level, because, you know, uh, what, you know, to show, uh, to make a film where these guys would actually um, proactively do anything uh, of a political edge would be completely, a, a complete caricature, really, a fantasy, if you like, uh, because the fact is, you know, people were despondent because there was no way out, and it remains the case, you know, for... for endless numbers of people. So that's, uh, that's what it was about, you know. Because I suppose in a film you search around for a sympathetic character. <laughs> you, I think naturally you do, don't you? Yeah. I found myself finding that the, uh, the council guy, the nearest thing to that in a way, with his statement about the uh, tell us about it when it's a grain of sand, don't wait until it's an ant anthill. Actually, it's very interesting that you should um, uh, see him as the sympathetic character, because in a way, as um, far as I was concerned, 
I mean... He was a baddie. Well, he wasn't a baddie, <laughs> but he had more bullshit. I mean, he's the bullshit man, really. Mm. I mean, because that is all bullshit, really. I mean, it, 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 it may be true at a philosophical level, but in terms of their, them and their needs and their window, I'm thinking, when well, this guy comes in and, he, and he's full of all this superior hippie stuff. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, um, uh, 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 superior, I mean, not superior. If you look at um, Marion Bailey's character, Auntie Barbara, I mean... I hope, if it works, you can see her from different points of view. Yeah, I thought she was the next uh, sympathetic character. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's up against it. She's sort of sold out. She knows that. She's bright. Um, but at the same time, she, you know, she's trying to do something which puts her in... She casts herself in a role which is um, ambivalent, really. But, I mean, you know, I'm not sure that... Uh, I mean, the parents are simply under so much pressure that they are, they've lost it, really. They've lost the, the, their rag, you know. And, and, and you know, um, there's always been a lot of discussion about Mark, Phil Daniels' character, the older brother. The fact is, in the end, you can see that he's actually looking out for his kid brother, that he's actually got values. He will actually go somewhere. He'll actually challenge the status quo. Well, I was thinking about him, that in a way he seemed like a precursor to David Thewlis's character in Naked. Yes, that's interesting, because I, I think that... I, I can't imagine, if we follow that um, thought, I can't imagine that Mark would uh, become negative. I mean, the stuff about, just to talk about uh, Johnny in Naked for a moment, the thing about that character is people have always said, oh, well, he's cynical. He's not cynical, he's an idealist. He's an idealist who has been disappointed by the world, and that disappointment, uh, I mean, he looks at all this uh, material cynicism, uh, that makes him turn in on himself and become negative. Uh, I can't see that happening to Mark. I think Mark is more likely to take things on board and challenge them and uh, deal with stuff in a positive way. But in the end, he looks at he's not far from from uh, calling him Kermit and um, <laughs> winding up his kid brother. He actually is looking out for him, really, and protecting him. He's obviously intelligent. Yeah. But having no real kind of outlet for, for, for this stuff, you're, apart from taking a piss out of his brother no, or telling people about llama racing or yeah. whatever, you know, he, yeah. he, he's, he's intelligent, he's smart, he's quick. But he hasn't really got any, anywhere to channel that. Well, I mean, in the end, apart from anything else, um, I, I, I suppose, and I was less consciously aware of this when making Mean Time than I was when I was making Naked, the culprit, the failure, is the education system. Because any half-decent gang of teachers would pull out a guy like Mark, or indeed Johnny in Naked, and turn out a positive, proactive kid, as opposed to somebody that was just, you know, taking the piss. Um, and I think that's the tragedy, really. Indeed, you could argue they might have done more to help a kid like uh, Colin. I, I'm talk I may be talking out of my backside here, but it strikes me that, that you know, there was a kind of deal struck after the war. Let, let's, we, we got through this thing the, what they call the post-war consensus or whatever, and, and let's try and make a better world and let's give education to people who haven't had access to it before. And this created something, and this actually... I'll use the Beatles as an example. No, I understand. You know, They're so, a symbol. Yeah, yeah because, because... So they came through that, they were educated, they were smart, they were quick. They became the biggest musical thing ever, creative force, you could say, within the 60s. And, and, and maybe it was a point at which, uh, where there were some, I'm not saying some particular person, but there was a realisation that, uh, hold on, if we educate these people and give them a chance, it's OK for them to get on a bit, but if they're actually going to be better than us, then we're fucked. <laughs> so, so we'd better kind of put the brakes on here. And, and in a way, that's what we're talking about with, with Thatcherism, that... that, that that there was a, a kind of thing of like uh, there's 
unions are getting too much power, basically ordinary people are getting too much power. Uh, let's let's turn it, let's put this thing in reverse and and start to lock it down. I think there's something in that. And I say that I mean I'm about twenty years older than you. And, and wiser. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, I say that because... I, I, so I was born in the middle of the war, and so I went to school in the 40s and 50s. I, I actually left school in 1960, actually. I think you're right. I think something happened, and I think what you're talking about was a move away from the, the, the robust nature of the education that we had in the immediate post-war years. And somewhere along the line, that's the context in which these neglected kids are the kids you find in meantime. The thing of going down to the unemployment office seems like a quaint, uh, not a quaint, but almost, almost like a quaint... Well, it's attractive because it was secure. Yeah, but, uh, because it doesn't exist anymore. No, quite. Because, like, yeah. uh, young people can't, can't sign on, can't, was, it, can't have... That's right. I mean, it was, it, you know, it's very complicated, this, isn't it? I mean, because, you know, I, I've just made a statement which I have to qualify, which is that it, I said it's attractive because it was secure, in the sense that it was there. That didn't make it good. I mean, it was, it was a palliative for a bad situation. I mean, jobs would have been better news. But it was... A, a, it was a structural element in people's lives for all its, and we've done it and we show it in the meantime, for all its uh, downside. I want to talk about Gary Oldman's character for, for a while. Uh, his, in a way, he's got the most vitality, or, he, well, he moves around more than most of the other characters, but obviously it's, it's, a, it's a very... Negative. I think. I think the very last shot you've got is almost like a hamster in a wheel. He's, he's like in a oil drum or something. Yeah. Just in a barrel. Building yeah, barrel. Yeah. In, uh, so that that all his energy comes from some kind of frustration. Totally. I mean, you know, he is an early manifestation of skinhead fascism, really, um, and it comes completely from a lack of motivation, lack of focus, lack of, you know, the opportunity to develop values, really. And I believe, didn't he have some kind of accident during the he did. filming? Well, not during... We were rehearsing it, and, um, it, you know, all these films of mine, and meantime, is no exception, as you know, come out of a great deal of improvisation, which is then ordered. Gary Oldman and Tim Roth were just improvising, doing the characters, uh, just playing around, really. We rehearsed this, we prepared the thing in a very big, empty, former f clothes factory. And there were lines of strip lights, fluorescent strip lights, that were on, on the ceiling. And they had already got to the stage where they were dressed and his head was shaved and he was in his skinhead gear and his boots and all that. And they were playing around with a milk bottle, chucking this milk bottle. I was just sitting in the corner quietly watching at some distance. And I just remember seeing all these red blodges appearing all over his head. And this milk bottle had hit the fluorescent light and showered glass oh, right. everywhere. It's very, very yeah. fine glass in those things. We rushed out. I had a car outside. We jumped in this car and we drove to the nearest hospital. And um, we ran in, and as we ran in, he said, for fuck's sake, tell him I'm an actor, not a real skinhead. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they fixed it, obviously. But it, it could have blinded him. It was lucky. Mm. Um, so I can't really ever ponder what that would have meant, you know. But if you see him in a close-up, in any film he's ever done since, it would have to be quite a big close-up, but you, there is a mark there between his... just there above his nose, um, which is a souvenir of this famous occasion. I was quite interested by the music in it, because the music is... Uh, 
it sounds like kind of Eastern European, like a, I don't know, is it like a zither or something like that, or a dulcimer? Or? It's not, it's a tack piano, it's a piano with drawing pins put in the, uh, oh, right, okay. in the hammers. Andrew Dixon um, composed music for a lot of my films, that was the first one he did actually. Um, did you like it? I did, yeah, School. because I thought they added a different dimension to it, because you might have thought, like there's one instance when Phil Daniels puts a, a, like a punk record on, Given the the subject matter, you might have thought more music like that or, or contemporary music, but I thought by putting something that kind of didn't have a very English feel to it, um, I thought that was quite satisfying. It's very interesting because, I mean, I think it's a great score, uh, and people either loved it or hated it at the time we came out, or uh, we brought the film out. Um, I, um, uh, I don't think of it as being... Uh, essentially un-English as such. Um, and certainly we didn't think Eastern European or anything l literal. I mean, but, but I think it is important to have uh, and helpful to have a score that doesn't, um, in too literal a way, uh, tell you where to place, tell the audience where to place what it's about, and its context. Yeah, I suppose that's what I, I thought in a way. We, we've talked about how it's it's a specific portrait of a very particular time, but with the music not seeming too tied to that, that seemed to say, well, this is just about humans reacting to a situation. I think that's right. That's exactly the thing. There's also something kind of small scale about it, which becomes quite epic in the context of the film. I, I think it's very successful. Mm. You mentioned this incident that you heard on the on the radio about the, these two guys who committed suicide. But I'm wondering about what other factors led into you deciding to do this project. But I mean, by that stage, uh, uh, this is four years into Thatcher. Um, like a lot of people, I was certainly starting to get very um, uh, engaged and. Um, angry about what was going on, really. I mean, the thing about unemployment is it, it became a real issue. So it was that. The point when I made Mean Time, my sons were two and five years of age, and, I was, and my elder son spent his entire life winding up my younger son. And, in fact, he carried on doing that till he came back from university. Mm. In fact, they're now very close. Um, but... Um, uh, in a way, in my head, I was um, uh, gifting this film about these two brothers to my lads. Uh, but that really doesn't in any way account for the motivation of the film being... No, but that's interesting, that, that, that because that dynamic between the two brothers is... In, is, is you can tell that, like you say, the Phil Daniels character doesn't want to admit that he cares about his brother, but he obviously does. But he, he chooses to show it by calling him names. Yeah, <laughs> and in the end, he comes out in his defence mm -hmm. and protects him, you know. I mean, there are loads of relationships between uh, siblings, between family members in my various films. It is one of the ones that I really am very fond of and proud of, in a way, because I think it's very strong and quite complex, really. Um, What's interesting to me about me and time, apart from anything else, and people's reaction to it, is I suppose the most, for some, what for some people, the most enigmatic or the only enigmatic element in the film, which I don't think should be enigmatic, is people's understanding of what is going on when Mark comes round to Barbara's house. Yes. Yeah, that, well, yeah, I was going to ask you about that, actually. Yeah. Of, of what's, your it, what's your take on it? Well, I don't know whether there's a slight jealousy that why wasn't I offered a job instead of him? I know what I think, and I know what, we, what, our, what was the motivation when we did it. Um, I'm sort of always in two minds about whether, you want, whether I want to explain the things or whether an audience should, as they should, simply decide what they think it is. Um, I think he's protecting him. I think he's just looking out for him, basically, looking out, looking after him. Um, 
protecting him in that sense, without really knowing what it is. That, um, and if you try, if you um, go back through the, all the scenes that preceded, from the point when she offers him the job, which of course isn't a job at all, um, and you know you get Mark questioning it and dismissing it. And the old man says, well, you're just jealous. He's not jealous at all. What is there to be jealous of? <laughs> you know, really. Um, We'd get a nice, probably get a nice lunch out. Well, I, I just, I just, uh, he's, he is, uh, and I deliberately show him in Trafalgar Square to leave you in no doubt about it. He is, he get, he's the only member of that family that gets out and about. He's, he is sort of footloose and fancy free, really. Um, and he, I think he just shows up because he, he doesn't like the taste, the, the, he doesn't like the patronising timbre, taste, flavour of the thing, really, in some yeah. way. It's, yeah, it's interesting, that, but like you said earlier, she is kind of caught between a rock and a hard place in a way, hasn't she? That she's left this background, which you can understand because it's pretty dismal, mm -hmm. but she's kind of stepped into a into a fairly uh, loveless and static marriage. Totally. And and the, in a way, part of her motivation for for getting him to come and do the work might be that thing of which I think is still something that kind of mystifies the middle classes a bit. That there is a certain vitality to people from the lower orders. And they're kind of there's a, a slightly vampiric kind of feeding on that sometimes, mm -hmm. and she's kind of she she realises she, she kind of in one way escaped from this background, but she's in this kind of vacuum. That's right. And she still yearns for that bit of excitement, a bit of life. I think that's right. Mm. I think that's right. And I mean, also she hasn't. I mean, what's also very clear. Um, and implicit when Mark asks her why she hasn't got any kids. I mean, plainly, she's got a problem with, you know, she wants kids, so it's a surrogate kid, you know, and she has, she, it's about that too. Um, but all these complexities and their contradictions, which I hope are there, and which I hope are there in films that I make, um, are the very things that our friends who wanted black and white sloganistic statements, hate hmm. or hated. Well, I think it goes through to the very end of the film because at that point, I wish to spoil it for people who are watching it, no. but at that point at the end of the film and you discover that he's shaved his head and you can make up your own uh, idea for the continuation of that. He either lets his hair grow back because he realises he looks a bit of a div and he's going to get called Kojak for <laughs> ages. Yeah. Or he actually goes down that route. Absolutely. And we that's, leave that. That's yeah, for the, that's something that you that's can for the, for the audience ponder. To Absolutely. Yourself. Absolutely. Think about looking at the film now from you know thirty odd years later. You, you've said that one of the things that's happened in the interim is that lots of those areas have become gentrified and stuff like that. But in a way, it is a kind of picture of a, a vanished world. And I wonder how, how, you know, what you think about the film now, looking at it from this distance. Of it was a, it was a, I guess it was a snapshot of a, of a particular moment in time. It, I, I'm sure it was, and it very much was intended to be. People say, "What's your favourite? What's your favourite album? What's your favourite film of your own?" And I do quite often say, "I've got a real soft spot for Meantime, actually." Um, I, I don't regard it as, I don't think of it, uh, uh, until you mention it, in terms of um, a snapshot of a long time ago. Uh, it's very much a living thing for me, meantime. And I suppose in the end, in the world, we don't know about some part of London or something, but in the world it is absolutely not um, obsolete in what it's about and the conditions under which people live and survive, really. Um, so I kind of... Um, I, I, I think it's one of those films of mine that I would be particularly pleased to leave behind, really. Mm.